Okay, everyone joining us today, welcome to Streamline Athletes, the meetup. This is episode one. I am really happy today to be joined by the three gentlemen who we'll introduce shortly that you see on your screen. Uh, this is episode one, the long stride. We will be focused on some all Canadian athletes today, and uh, we're looking at some middle distance and distance runners uh, from Canada representing some different professional teams. My name is Brett Montrose. I'm one of our founders and one of our co-CEOs here at Streamline Athletes. If you're not familiar with Streamline Athletes, we are the place to be for high school to college track and field and cross country recruitment. We provide a free to use platform for athletes and we help them use data to find the right collegiate program for them. With that, I'll also just mention that uh, we are more than happy to take some questions from the audience today. So please use the chat on the right side of your screen if you're on your computer and you can enter some questions in there. Um, just make sure that um, make sure that you're throwing those into the chat to, um, to the general chat, not specifically to one person and we'll be able to get to those nearer to the end of the session. And with that, um, I am thrilled to introduce our panel today. Uh, first of all, I would love to introduce Justin Knight. Justin is joining us as a former Syracuse University varsity track and field and cross country athletes. Justin is currently representing the Reebok Boston Track Club. And if you're not familiar with Justin, here are some of his career highlights. He is the 2018 NCAA Division I indoor track and field medalist, a silver in the 3000 and a gold medal in the 5000 meters, both at the same meet there. Uh, he's the Canadian record holder in the indoor 1500 meter with a mark of three minutes, 36.13. And also just to top things off, Justin is the NCAA D1 cross country champion from 2017. Hey, Justin, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Brett. Where are you joining us from today? Where in the world are you? Uh, right now I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. That's, uh, that's where our team trains and we had a nice sunny day today, so I'm smiling ear to ear. <laughs> right on. Great to have you, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, next on the docket, uh, we have our very own Ben Flanagan. Ben is a former University of Michigan athlete, also currently training and representing Reebok Boston Track Club. Uh, ben is the 2018 NCAA D1 outdoor champion in the 10,000 meters and also the 2019 Canadian 10,000 meter champion. What's up, Ben? Where are you today and how's training going for you? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me today, Brett. Super stoked to be here alongside uh, these Canadian studs. Um, I am also in Charlottesville, Virginia. So uh, same city as Justin. Uh, just traveled back from uh, West Virginia today where uh, I was uh, putting in some miles not too far away. So got back in town. Excited to see the sun like Justin and uh, stoked for the conversation <laughs> today. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Ben. And last but most certainly not least is Charles Philibert Tibito. We'll probably refer to him as a CPT for the rest of the interview here today because my French is yeah. not as great as it should be. Uh, CPT uh, is our guest joining us uh, as a former U Sports athlete. And if you're not familiar with U Sports, this is uh, the, uh, the Canadian circuit for uh, university sport. And uh, CPT is a, a former Laval University athlete. Uh, Charles is now representing New Balance uh, recently, and uh, we'll probably jump into some more conversation about that coming up. Um, some highlights for CPT. He is a three times national champion in the 1500 meters, and he also represented Canada at the 2016 Rio Olympics, also in the 1500 meter. Welcome, CPT. Thanks for joining us today. Where are you? Thanks, Brett. I'm actually not too far away from you guys. I am in Kitsilano, Vancouver. Uh, it has been my uh, training base for most of the winter so far and spring uh, in the last year. So things are going really well and uh, enjoying the West Coast. Awesome. Welcome to, uh, to everyone here. Um, I am going to be jumping through some questions and uh, some of you guys might get the same questions, some different, uh, but we'll kick things off here today with uh, a topic of conversation with you, Ben. Um, I'd love if you could share a little bit of how you got into track and field to begin with and, and how you found your, your love and your passion for running. And if you were involved in any other sports along the way as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, start, I'm Canadian. So I played hockey growing up. It's the thing to do. Uh, so I had a pair of skates on my feet for most of my life, uh, dabble with some other sports, uh, baseball, lacrosse. 
Um, swimming wasn't that uh, incredible at any of them, to be honest, but I love doing them. Um, yeah. And so what happened is I, you know, I naturally always felt pretty comfortable running. And I felt like, you know, when we went out for the annual track meet in grade seven or eight, where I didn't do anything serious, but I uh, got the chance to race against some other people in my class. It was something I always like excelled at. So uh, both my older sisters, I'm one of three and I'm the baby in the family. Uh, they were at the high school uh, cross country team uh, with the coach there, Christina Sullivan, and they uh, raved about it. They had an amazing time. And uh, my first day of high school when I was nervous, you know, about meeting friends and going to class and whatever, uh, they uh, encouraged me to come out to cross country. And um, I loved it. I And the thing I loved the most about it was the team dynamic. Uh, it was a very inclusive environment. Uh, I went to St. Mary's High School in Kitchener, Ontario, and uh, we had a gigantic team, uh, a range of abilities, and uh, we just had so much fun. So uh, that combined with a phenomenal mentor and coach at the time, who was Christina Sullivan, um, she noticed, you know, I had a natural talent in the sport and really uh, challenged me to pursue that further. Um, so I actually ended up running for the grade 10 team as a grade nine. And uh, that was super motivating for me running against some older athletes. Um, and then after that year, I ended up joining a track club and that's where I really, um, started to get into the sport a little more seriously and, uh, fell in love with it, started running competitions, uh, eventually against this guy over here to, uh, <laughs> my side. But, um, yeah, I just, uh, I always love the sport. I love the team dynamic. And then, uh, you know, longer I got into it and the more challenging it became, I really loved just the, um, the process itself and training and competition. Awesome. I guess we'll use that as a good segue to, to jump right over to Justin, which is who you were uh, referring to when you mentioned bumping into in, in the high school rounds there. Um, Justin, how about you? Uh, what was kind of the first taste of track and field or, or cross country that made it stick for you? How old were you? And, and were there any other sports that helped you um, get to, to running as your, your primary sport? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say that Ben, we probably rarely bumped into each other because in high school, he was so far ahead of me, so <laughs> I, would, I would see him from afar, but, uh, you know, all jokes aside, um, I actually had a pretty interesting story of getting into running. It seemed to be kind of an accident. Um, my whole life, I grew up playing basketball. I come from, like, a basketball family. My dad loves the sport. My brother loves the sport. Um, I played since I was probably, like, five years old all the way till about 16, 17, and... Um, when I went to school, I went to the St. Michael's College School in Ontario, uh, Toronto, Ontario, to be exact. And I played on the varsity basketball team and the varsity volleyball team over there. Uh, both teams I was playing with my brother. So it was a lot of fun. And I loved both the sports. And uh, funny enough, how I ended up getting into running was um, it was actually in gym class. And we were like receiving like our midterm marks or something like that. And <laughs> I got my mark back and I had like a 68 in gym class. And <laughs> I don't know, at that point in my life, I was just like, come on, like, this is the one area where I'm supposed to come back with a 90 plus. And I was looking at it. I went to the gym teacher and I was like, you know, Mr. Chittle, when, uh, that was his name. It's like, what's going on? Like, why is my mark so low? Um, like I'm leading the basketball team, uh, you know, or my team in, in basketball and gym class. I was doing well in football as a quarterback in my class, um, all sorts of stuff, badminton. The only thing I wasn't that good at was hockey, believe it or not, Ben. <laughs> I could skate, but I can't stop. That was the only problem. And um, <laughs> and then uh, from, from there, uh, he went on to tell me that, like, you know, your team might be doing well, but your mark reflects, like, how much effort I see you giving. And he's like, even though, you know, your team's winning, I don't think that you're putting your best foot forward. And therefore, like, that's the mark that you have. And I was kind of begging and pleading with him. I was just like, hey, like, I can't bring this home to my parents. Like, how can I change my mark? Uh, how can we change this? And he just told me that there's like one unit left, which was running. And uh, in grade 10, we have to run like an annual 5K, all the grade 10s. We run a 5K kind of behind the school. And um he told me if I show that I'm giving my best in that unit, then he'll bump my mark up. And um, every day when we practiced, I made sure I was at the front of the class. And then when it came down to it, um, I ended up breaking like the grade 10 5K record or something like that. And then uh, my future uh, track and field coach, he actually didn't believe me 
uh, Mr. Bergen, you didn't believe that I ran that because there was guys on the track team in my class. And uh, luckily my gym teacher, he kind of, he preached to the, to the coach saying like, Oh no, he's not lying. I was right beside him on the bike the whole time. And um, from there, they ended up putting me on the team. What a, what a natural transition. <laughs> Just uh, you hear that story so often where there's the, the natural runner uh, who's not on the track team doing so well in PE class that they, they end up on the track team almost, uh, almost by accident. And then uh, in your case, the rest is, is history and hopefully future yeah. history as you keep going here. My um, mom almost didn't let me do it though. She was saying I was missing too much school, so <laughs> they have to beg her to let me. <laughs> well, there, there we go. Glad um, we're glad that she did. Uh, <laughs> CPT, same, same question for you, CPT. But um, I would love if you could transition from how you got into running, uh, any other sports that you participated in along the way, and then um, just touch on how that uh, took you to Laval after that, and then Justin right. and Dan will, will start to talk recruiting with you guys as well. Right. Uh, so I, I think I'm somehow in the same boat as Justin uh, in the sense that I did, I did, I did try all the sports when I was younger. Um, and then uh, um, more naturally in high school, I was doing a book, a bit more of uh, soccer, basketball and freestyle skiing. Uh, and by the end of high school, I was really more into uh, freestyle skiing. And I'm actually good friends with Alex Beaulieu Marchand with, who won an Olympic medal in, on, in the slope style. So like that's, that's my background. And it's really, it really doesn't work with uh, track and field when you think about it. But I was just like that, that fast kid that uh, would be tireless um, in basketball or soccer. So uh, my phys ed teacher would always send me to cross country and track. Um, my first provincials ever were in what would be grade 11 or like grade 10 in, in, in Ontario or like in the English school system. And I got close to dead last in my cr first provincial cross country race because I lost a shoe in the mud. Um, I, I swore on my mother that I would never run again in the race. And then the next year I got second at those provincial championships. So like things turned around quite a bit and uh, you know, like, when you get to uh, the end of high school, it's a bit, a bit of a crossroad. Uh, you know, if you do a lot of sports, you kind of have to choose that one sport. You think you're going to be good enough to keep practicing in, in Quebec. It would be Cégep and then at university. And uh, to me, it was clear that uh, it wasn't going to be soccer anymore. It wasn't going to be basketball and, you know, freestyle skiing was a lot of fun. Uh, but it's, 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 it's not like it's a high performance environment at all. It's more, you know, chilling with your friends and having fun on the slopes. So I just thought, well, maybe I'm not that bad at this running thing. And that's, I should probably put much more effort into it and uh, join a club. So that's how I joined the, uh, the University Laval Club, which they have like their uh, collegiate track club, but they also have a developmental uh, side of the club. So I joined that. And st like in my st starting at my senior year I, of high school, I just uh, basically started training with uh, the guys from the university over there. And uh, if I am to transition into how I just stayed there, um, I think culturally in Quebec, something that is interesting is we are not really encouraged to go away for college, uh, not nearly as much as, uh, you know, my friends that I know from Ontario or BC or the U S it seems like culturally uh, in English Canada or in the U S like you go away for college, you just leave your hometown. Whereas in Quebec, people just like chill wherever they, they grew up and like go just staying at your parents' house and going to university, like hometown university is totally fine. So uh, that was the case for me. Um, I didn't get recruited anywhere, believe it or not. So for me, it just made sense to stay home, uh, get to, you know, stay around my high school friend, but also just get to uh, keep going with that track club I enrolled with uh, after high school and just uh, keep progressing there. And uh, maybe the interesting thing about uh, this whole process was that in my year, uh, there, were, there were also two pretty good guys uh, on the national junior level. Their name were Emmanuel Boisvert and Jean-Samuel Lapointe. So these two guys, plus myself, we kind of formed this core of three 
guys that we just decided, hey, let's stay, let's stick to home and just go to Laval and make our own team there and try to, you know, flip this team into a national level uh, track and field team. And that's that's how like I really we really got into this performance mindset uh, from that moment on. Awesome. So in summary, I guess you could, you could say that you had a, a really organic shift from where you were already training your high school training environment to the uh, collegiate level, because the, the club environment was so ingrained with the university team there in Laval. Um, I guess a question for you based on that is uh, just, to, I find a lot of the times when we're talking to the high school student athletes, it's hard to understand um, the size of the track and field landscape and just how, um, tip top of an elite level athlete you need to be to get on the radar um, and that uh, you don't need to be that tip top to even make a, a division one team sometimes you can put yourself on the radar um, what was your kind of PR or in your best event when you came from high school and made the transition to uh, the Université de Laval yeah so I think uh, this summer from between I guess I would have been recruited before if, if that had been the process, but like the summer before my freshman year of university, I ran, I think I ran 352 for the 1500 and like 15 flat for the 5k, I believe. Uh, the year before that I ran four flat for the 1500. So that would be like grade 12. I would have been at around four minutes flat for, for 1500, but then, you know, really just, under-trained athlete and you know like at that age between the age of 18 and 21 you can you know like I I would I would crush 15 seconds off of my PB every year in the 15 so that's just how it goes but um yeah so for me basically running four minute in the 1500 back then um I don't think recruiters had really had highs uh in Quebec in the province uh I don't think the province as a whole was really that talented uh, people spend a lot more time looking at what's going on in Ontario and BC. So I guess just the lack of local talent, plus the fact that even within that lack of talent, I wasn't a shining star, um, just kind of made it easier for me to stay home because nothing came really. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, <laughs> we'll bounce, we'll bounce uh, over to, to Justin now. Um, I'd love to hear Justin a little bit about, uh, your recruiting journey, how you found yourself at, at Syracuse. And then I'll probably have another couple questions to poke in there as you're going along. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so my recruiting journey was actually pretty easy. Uh, interesting. Sorry. Um, I had no intentions on running track and field, I guess, like in college originally, like I, I wasn't dreaming of that, like in grade 11 and stuff. Um, I think how my recruiting journey kind of started was thanks to Ben, actually. Um, I was in a phenomenal race at, at OFSA um, in the 3K. It was the 3K, right, Ben? And um, I remember, like, there was a bunch of great guys in that field. We had Ben, we had Ryan Sliman, Brandon Allen, Troy Smith. And it was actually, I think it was the fastest, like, top five, top six finish in, um, in OFSA history. And those guys pulled me along to, I think I got six. I might've been fifth, but um, either way, I was the, like the youngest person to run uh, a pretty good time of being like, I think I ran 817 or 819 that year. And um, all the other guys, like they already had their schools picked out. They were older than me, but um, some of their coaches came out to watch and stuff like that. So thankfully for them, they kind of put me on the radar to a lot of, a lot of college coaches. And I guess from there, I was on a couple people's radar. Um, I think uh, Ohio State was, I think, the first school to actually reach out to me from, um, from the States. The first Canadian school to reach out to me was University of Waterloo. I'll always remember I took an official visit out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, shout out to Ben's hometown. Um, it, was, it was a lot for me just because I was prepping to go to school in Canada and not even for athletics. And the way it works in the Canadian system is like your grade 11 and 12 marks are the marks that universities look at when they look at your application. Whereas when I started getting recruited to the NCAA, all of a sudden they're taking like my cumulative GPA from grade nine, 10, 11, and 12. 
and um I didn't have like the best well I had I had decent marks but I didn't they weren't as good as I wanted them to be because I struggled in grade nine in grade 10 and then I started finding myself and what I was interested in grade 11 and 12 so um it was really hard because then I had to like get ready for the uh ACT I took the ACT instead of the SAT and um once I was able to get like the grade that I needed my um my recruiting process was like a lot smoother because I then had the marks that I needed to apply to certain universities um seeing that I got into running so late I didn't take all five of my official visits I kind of just narrowed it down to two um being Syracuse and Wisconsin and um I guess how I ended up going to Syracuse or how Syracuse actually got interested in me where was uh we had an alumni that was good friends with uh my current coach right now and also Syracuse's former coach Chris Fox and he texted him and he's like oh you're not going to believe this like we have this really good runner that went to my like former high school I promise I'm not just saying this because he's an alumni but you should really look out for this kid and um I guess they looked at me and they saw my times and um I think they probably saw some race footage of me and they they got interest and uh from there we started having phone conversations and then after my official visit uh taking I think I took like maybe a couple weeks or a month and then I told them that I was going to go to Syracuse awesome story that just goes to show how important it is to you know we hear it all the time when we're in high school and it it just kind of goes off your back like um, like it's nothing, but the grades are so important when it comes to making yeah. sure that you have, have those doors left open for you. And then I think another takeaway that we should just hit on there is the, the ACT, SAT. Um, if you're a high schooler listening to this, making sure that um, if you want uh, the United States and, and the NCAA on your radar when it comes to that, um, take those earlier than later. Um, that way, mm -hmm. if it doesn't go as well as it can, you can rewrite and use your best score. So yeah, SAT, ACT, just, yeah. And your grades stay on top of those. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to say one thing about the grades point just before I forget, but whenever I talk to high schoolers, I always tell them that, um, you know, sometimes you might not be offered a full scholarship at the school that you want to go to, at least an athletic scholarship. And I always tell the kids, like, don't let that be the ending deciding factor on whether or not you go to that school, because um, it's really important to take your academics just as serious as your athletics because let's say every every kid just saw hayward field like it looks beautiful so i can only imagine a bunch of kids want to go to oregon now and um let's say your oregon's your dream school and they offer you like a 60 percent athletic scholarship um if you have great grades and you're just as determined in the books and in school as you are on the track then you might be able to find yourself like a 40 percent academic scholarship and then all of a sudden you have a full scholarship so i think like just as you said, Brett, like the academic piece can really make your life a lot easier. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Justin. I think that's key, key information for high schoolers. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the piece about Oregon is funny, too, because uh, I think for, for Canadian middle school and or mid, not middle school, middle distance and, and distance runners, Oregon is always the first thing we think of. But there's so many other yeah. options out there that that should be on the radar, too. Um, ben, bouncing over to you. Uh, thumbs up or down, you have a, a University of Michigan tattoo on your leg. Yeah, okay. So we've got a University of Michigan Wolverine alum with us here today, uh, etched in ink forever. Um, ben, I'd love if you could tell us um, about how you ended up at Michigan and made that choice. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, and the one thing I, I have to comment on is this race that Justin's alluding to uh, in, in his uh, in his comments, because I think it's so funny. Uh, the dynamic of Justin and I in high school, um, and I know Justin brought up earlier that I beat him in high school, which I do like to brag about occasionally to people considering how su successful Justin's career has been. But uh, the reason I ever had a chance beating Justin in high school is because I ran a lot longer than him. And uh, in terms of the overlap of our career, you know, I was kind of the the four year, uh, you know, cross country track and field veteran at that point on my way going to college, had all everything checked the boxes, everything figured out. And Justin was like just entering the game. Um, and it was pretty cool for us to cross paths kind of at the end of my journey and at the beginning of his. And uh, Justin's totally right. Uh, our my particular uh, class in high school, we had a just a standout class of athletes in Ontario. 
um, I, I, as well as other places in Canada. Um, you know, the, always the, the, the bar just keeps getting raised higher and higher every year. But in our particular year, we had a bunch of people going to the U.S. and they were announcing, you know, I was going to Michigan, Jeremy Kugler was going to Indiana, someone else going to Iona. And uh, anyways, race goes on. We finish. Justin runs an amazing PB. Um, and as he said, a time that was really going to set him up for the future recruiting wise. And he came up, came up to me afterwards and he's like, dude, I think it's so cool. You're going to Michigan, man. Like that's so sick. And I was like, I don't think you realize like what you just did today. Like you're going to have a lot of people knocking on your door, like after this performance. So it just opened up my eyes in terms of like where he was in the sport. Um, after I just finished this whole recruiting process, you know, got that load off my chest and Justin, Justin just didn't even understand like the opportunities he was about to get into himself. So it was pretty cool to see. Um, and obviously it worked out so well at Syracuse. So that was, uh, you know, amazing to follow along as well. In terms of my personal experience, um, the biggest thing for me, the asset that I had is, um, my high school, my high school coach, uh, Christina Sullivan that I keep bringing up. Um, she was, a uh, you know, seven time all American at Villanova, um, understood the collegiate landscape super well. Um, and, uh, I had a teammate of mine named Jamie Fallon, who was just another standout athlete that I could kind of, um, you know, just not only look up to, but also, um, talk to and figure out like what her situation was like, what she was learning about. So I had a really good support system, um, to not only get great mentoring from someone who's been through the process themselves, but another person to kind of go along through it. So, um, my support, support network was a phenomenal, um, and Christina really outlined, you know, what was really going to take for me to accomplish those goals. Uh, I, I, early on, I decided I want to go to, uh, the U S um, I'm a huge track and field nerd. I always have been once I got in the sport and, um, you know, I loved following Kevin Sullivan, Nathan Brennan in particular, who both went to the university of Michigan and NCAA. Um, so the first school that reached out to me, uh, was actually the university of Virginia. Um, the head coach was Pete Watson, uh, who's Canadian. And the funny thing is the Michigan coach and the Virginia coach are very good friends. So although Christina really wanted me to go to Michigan, I never heard from them. And, you know, I was a high school kid. I was running fast. I was winning races. I kind of had this ego. That's like, I'm waiting for schools to talk to me, you know, like I, like I'm going to wait to be recruited. Days go by Michigan's not reaching out to me at any point. So eventually my high school coach took matters in her own hands emailed the Michigan coach. Hey, like we got a great athlete right across the border, four hours away running these times. And he responded saying, Hey, I know your athlete. I only found out about him from my friend. Uh, just, you know, bro protocol for recruiting coaches that are friends. I can't, I don't want to reach out to him because I only found out from another coach that's recruiting him. But if Ben reaches out to me, it's fair game. So sure enough, I had to put my ego aside. I had to go to my computer type. Hi, coach Gabby. I'm interested in the university of Michigan. And that was my only ticket there. Um, and I was so excited to do it. Uh, eventually I was deciding between university of Virginia, the university of Michigan, and, uh, similarly to Justin, the university of Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, it just culturally was a really good fit. Um, I loved how close to home it was. I really fit in with the coaching team. Um, so I ended up going there, but, uh, yeah, if I never, uh, you know, kind of put my ego aside and, and reached out to a coach as opposed to waiting to be recruited, that opportunity never would have even happened. Yeah, great. So I guess the the big takeaway there, Ben, is uh, put your ego aside and and uh, and take the recruiting journey into your own hands because you'll probably open up a lot more doors for yourself that way. Um, it's a bonus to have coaches from incredible schools that you may or may not be interested in reaching out to you, um, but you can create an even longer list if you um, do your research and uh, and send the right information over to those schools. Um, thanks for sharing that. Okay. Going to do a quick rapid fire round. We're going to go CPT, then Justin, then Ben. Um, who, when you made that leap from high school to the collegiate level, was the number one uh, track and field or cross country athlete that you looked up to at the time? Your uh, your high school idol. Oh, I I don't know. I I didn't know the sport enough. I guess <laughs> uh, would probably. Oh, I think I uh, actually have, I have a good one. It would be Olivier Colin. Uh, so that guy was a shining star at the age of 21. He ran 3:38 and 1:46, and unfortunately, injuries slowed him down to a uh, retirement, uh, early retirement. But that guy was just uh, 
had he been healthy, he would have been crushing it. And uh, I'll always remember at Junior Nats when he outkicked Mohamed at the line for 8K cross. And, like, he's an 800, 1500 guy. So, like, I guess for, for, for me, that was that guy, Olivier Cullen. Justin, how about you? Um, I'm going to give you a couple just because <laughs> there was only a couple people that I knew. I think just looking at the history books from OFSA, like Greg Anderson and Mike Woods come straight to mind automatically because I was trying to chase the records that I never got. Um, but in college, um, Edward Cheserek, I had the pleasure of meeting him in my senior year and we became friends and then I followed his career from there. And um, Cam Levins, once I actually started like paying attention to track, Cam Levins was that guy for me. Yeah. You stole mine. Uh, I can't. Oh, damn, yeah, sorry. no, it's good. It's good. So Cam, uh, you know, <laughs> the year we, we were going to college, around the time I was going to college, Cam just uh, doubled winning the, you know, 5K and 10K at NCAA championships. Uh, there was a lot of Canadians like Mohamed I also looked up to that, uh, you know, was kind of knocking on door of winning NCAAs, uh, and, and Cam was the guy to do it around that time. Sheila Reed was another Canadian at the time who won NCAAs, oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, to me it was really cool to see Canadians, you know, winning uh, – a race that, you know, it's like, wow, maybe like one day, like Canadians can do it. Like Canadians go to the U S and they can win this race. Uh, so the one thing I'll say is I end up being uh, teammates sort of with Cam Levins. I was on the junior team. He was on the senior team at a, a meeting, oh, yeah. uh, Nack Yaks and Cam ran uh, 40 miles in one day, which I don't recommend oh anybody God. do because Cam was a monster <laughs> mileage guy. So my inspiration for him I took a little too seriously and I got back from that trip and I ran my highest mileage week ever. I ran like 75 miles and I just Boy. like injured myself immediately. I'd take like two and a half weeks <laughs> off. So oh uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I looked up the Cam Lemons for better or for worse uh, in, that, in that time of my life. Amazing. So you guys know Cam Levins is a, uh, he's a Vancouver Islander oh, uh, yeah. from the, yep. from the West West coast, yep. uh, which is where I grew up. Um, so he's from about an hour away from me and a few years older. Right. So I remember Cam um, destroying the field uh, with his, his Afro um, yeah. <laughs> when I was, when I was with a, a track and field club in grade six or seven, and he's been dominant in the sport since, uh, since he was really quite young and uh, it's yeah. been fascinating to follow his career. So yeah, I remember him from being 12 years old and seeing Cam Levins as well. Uh, incredible awesome. stuff. Um, okay. On that note, um, let's bounce to the collegiate level of, of each of your careers. Um, and let's try and do this a little bit more rapid fire if we can. Um, and again, let's go. Long we'll, we'll go yeah, we're going to switch the order here. We're going to go Ben, then Justin to CPT. Um, I would love to know just quickly what your collegiate experience was, what was like, um, and then, anything that you could uh, touch on um, in terms of team culture, maybe your favorite memory um, and uh, just what, you know, school social and, and track life was like, um, whatever, whatever you like to share about your experience in general at the collegiate level at Michigan. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, I had an amazing time there. Um, I spent five years, five and a half years in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, where the university was uh, finishing my, my master's at the end of uh of it all. So I spent a lot of time there, um, had an amazing time. Uh, it was a big adjustment for me, like getting used to, I came from a pretty, um, I don't know, I would say unorthodox training background in high school. So getting into more structure, the course load, um, you know, higher mileage, weight room, all that stuff was pretty tough for me to transition in. And, uh, I also put very high expectations on myself. So for me, it was kind of playing a long game. Um, I had to kind of adjust my goals, um, you know, every year, sometimes every season to kind of just keep myself motivated to try to hit those next targets. Cause, uh, I set my, my sights really, really high as soon as I came in. Um, and I was pretty overwhelmed with, you know, the level of talent and depth, um, in the races that I was competing in, um, overall, the main takeaways, I mean, I had a, I had a rocky road, a bit of a roller coaster experience at Michigan in terms of my running career. Um, I faced a number of, of pretty significant injuries that put me out of the sport for, um, months and I had to do a lot of rehab and uh, building up to even get back to baseline and then improve off of that, um, which was, you know, a pretty big learning experience uh, for me uh, in terms of just trusting the process, staying patient with things and, uh, you know, just again, adjusting goals on the fly. Um, you know, team culture was amazing. Uh, you know, other guys get injured on the team and I think we did a really good job just making sure everyone felt included and, you know, really building each other up whenever they were going through more challenging experiences athletically. 
Um, on the academic side, Michigan was a pretty challenging uh, academic institution. Um, I did well academically, but um, my, my study habits were not good. I would, uh, I would encourage anybody that's trying to pursue um, track and field in, uh, at the university level to um, you know, really prioritize sleep and recovery. Um, as I said, I experienced a number of injuries and um, I, I have a pretty bad procrastination problem when it comes to uh, my study habits. And I feel like uh, a few more hours of sleep every night probably would have done me well and maybe kept me a little bit more healthy. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, it all culminated at the right time. Um, I kind of took all my experiences that I learned throughout the whole process and applied them in my final year. Um, and that's where I saw the most success, uh, mostly um, you know, attributing to my NCAA title and my, my last race in a Michigan uniform. And uh, that was the most proud uh, you know, I ever was just being a part of uh, Michigan history and um, you know, the current culture that I was in throughout my time there. Awesome. And uh, Justin, how about your experience at, uh, at Syracuse? Again, yeah. uh, things like team culture, any favorite trips or memories that you had, and then kind of oh, man. just how, <laughs> how you're... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep it short. <laughs> favorite memories, oh my God, that would, that would take us to like tomorrow. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I enjoyed Syracuse. I love Syracuse. I feel like it's a second home for me. Um, the school honestly has been more than welcoming. I feel like they're family to me. Um, not just the track and field team, but the whole athletic department and the, the whole institution in general. Um, the chancellor has been great to me. Um, the athletic director has been great to me. I know them. I know him personally. He's great. Um, my experience at Syracuse was very unique. Um, unlike Ben, my training was actually very similar to what I did in high school. A lot of tempos, uh, hill workouts, um, no weight room stuff and I still don't do weight room stuff right now um but uh yeah I mean when I came out of college my coach he said listen like you run 20 miles a week or sorry when I came out of high school he said like you run like 20 miles a week uh we're gonna up it a little bit we'll get you to 30 maybe 35 um but we'll slowly progress it because we don't want you to break um and you can just do a little bit of the workout so it worked out really well for me in that sense um in regards to the culture on the team, uh, I was very fortunate to have just phenomenal teammates, just great, even outside of like the sport of running. Like a lot of those people ended up being my best friends today and uh, a really supportive group. I knew that if I needed them for something, I could rely on them. Um, in terms of training, like we were a pretty serious group and uh, what our team, we as a whole collective, like we had what you call a dry season. And uh, I know kids shouldn't be drinking anyways, but uh, you know, sometimes that happens in college, but our team like made sure that when we were in season that we didn't drink at all. And then, um, after that, you know, kids can do whatever they want. So I think that was just a really good thing to have a team culture where everybody had that understanding of what, what needed to be done in order for us to be successful. Um, I think my greatest memory there, uh, people always ask me this and, you know, it's not me winning any of those individual titles. It's, it will always be 2015. Uh, when Syracuse, we won the national championship as a team. Uh, that was the most special moment for me just because um, it's, a, it's a lot more heartwarming when you can celebrate something with others rather than just, you know, being proud of yourself. And uh, that was a big moment for our, our squad. That's something we trained for, for our whole time there. And um, an honorable mention would be when we won ACC indoor uh, track and field, our conference meet as a team, because we didn't have throwers. We didn't have long jumpers or anything. We just literally had distance runners and a couple of hurdlers. And uh, everybody worked so hard that we were able to beat the entire conference with just like a couple of events. So that was a big deal for me as well. Um, on the academic side, uh, <laughs> I was laughing really hard at Ben because I'm the king of procrastination. If you, <laughs> I used to procrastinate a lot in school and um, I, I don't know why I think, you know, maybe it's just a distance runner thing, but um, Syracuse is really challenging academically, but thankfully through, you know, the athletic staff and the school, we had a lot of support around us. I had uh, tutors that I'd see like pretty much almost every day. Um, they'd help me do as much as like help me work on my math or my biology or actually organize my entire schedule and plan out my week and when to devote time to doing projects. So um, I was really thankful for this, um, the staff that they gave us. And uh, without them, I probably would have had, I would have had a lot tougher of a time in college. 
Yeah, those, you know uh, what, those Justin, teeth. Uh, I can't, I can't, <laughs> no, you know what, I'm just going to bounce off because I can totally relate to the, uh, the team memories. Like I have won a lot of indi- individual uh, gold medals in the U sports system, but nothing yeah. will be the first year uh, we were on the podium as a team for cross country. Like nothing will beat that. And like, I think I, I still put it on top of the Olympics, to be honest, like what you live oh. As, yeah. as a team uh, in university is something I will cherish forever. And like um, running professionally beyond uh, university is a great opportunity for, for life and for a career. But honestly, like the team bonding you get, yeah. uh, it doesn't, it doesn't come back. So that's one thing I think uh, a high school athlete should be on the lookout for. Um, but then, cherish every uh, moment. Yeah, absolutely. But uh you know what, like for me, uh, going to Laval University, I think uh, the university, the sports program uh, within Canada is one of the highest, uh, you know, uh, goal setting uh, program in all sports uh, in, 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 in Canada within the U sports. I think U of T has had like some, some good championships in, uh, in like swimming and, you know, football, UBC is up there, but Laval is always up there in all those sports and track and field was just like a terrible sport for the Laval program. And I just happened to be in this crop of athletes that were like, you know what, let's make this, um, let's make Laval a track university. It's not just a football university. Like Laval is one, probably like eight to 10, uh, U sports, uh, championships in football uh, they've won a bunch in volleyball uh, and swimming as well so we were like we we need this excellence and put it in track and field and like we made it our own thing and uh you know first year i competed at this uh youth sports cross-country championships as a team we came in 13th and the next year we came in fifth and the following year we came in second so um this is just like a couple of teammates and myself and our coach taking matters into our own hands and saying like, let's, you know, uh, let's, let's make us a championship team. And uh, I think it was very special at the time because um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, if I were to describe my days in university, it was, pro- it would probably be work hard, play hard. Um, social was a, a bit, a big thing for us. We did not have a dry season. Um, however, it did, it did not, prevent us from training really hard and training taking training really seriously and uh you know it just all this culmination of uh you know being the underdogs that were up and coming and becoming a force in track and field and cross country being a part of that being part of the leadership in that and you know as well as um i think laval is great academics and i have a i think i graduated after my five years with a really good gpa uh, in business and public relations. And, you know, that's, I'm, I'm proud of my, um, of my, the work I've done there because, um, you know, it was very formating for me to be able to, you know, take part of the, take part of the team that would also set high goals for this, for themselves, uh, that would need leadership to launch themselves into a championship contention team. Uh, as well as uh, keeping balance with um, sc- academics and, and training. And I think something that has helped me the most uh, in terms of like something that I still have today after competing as a student athlete is really having a rigorous uh, training schedule. And, you know, when I was in school, it would be run, study, run, or run, study, weights, run. And like, I would even work part-time. So um going to university really ha- helped me set the tone into like having a, uh, a solid routine. And um, there's, there's just stuff like that that you get from being a student athlete that you don't really get any, anywhere else. And, um, you know, being at Naval was a bit, like you said, Brett, at the beginning, a bit organic. They didn't get recruited anything else. But if it were to be done again, I don't think I would do any, anything different because to me it was a great balance in terms of, uh, in terms of school athletics and also uh, social uh, environment uh, that really propelled me to, you know, take uh, a choice after school to, to be able to say, okay, that now I think it's time to go 100% in athletics. 
Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I think uh, it's funny, Justin and, and CPT, you guys both touching on the, uh, the, the way that the collegiate and university system kind of forces you to figure out your organization and your time management, especially it's so funny as a, as a rookie athlete coming in. And especially as a, I find the men are worse than the women in, in university as we're figuring things out. Um, but it's so key to use your resources and make sure that, um, you get structured in terms of like sleeping, training, studying, and using all the resources that you have to do it. Um, so I think that, that's, that, that's just awesome. Um, yeah. We've got 10 minutes to go here. So um, I'm going to bounce from the collegiate chat um, down to um, a quick one question about now running professionally. Um, is it how you expected it to be? And if you had to summarize what being a pro track athlete is like, um, how would you put it? Mm-hmm. And let's, let's go first. to Justin. You you spoke, so you're first. There you go. <laughs> Dang. Um, I'm not gonna lie. When I became a pro, like it was very different than I expected. Um, you know, I have a bunch of friends that have gone pro, but I, you know, everybody's experience is a little bit different. I think um, I I didn't have the pro the start to my pro career the way that I wanted to. I you know, got dead last in a pretty, pretty big race and, uh, ran for me, my slowest mile time. So it was very, very disappointing. But, um, from what I learned is that like being a pro, it just, you have a lot more free time, but you're also a little bit more independent where, you know, in college, we always had our coaches watching us, making sure that we show up to practice, make sure that we're doing our core. Sure. For you guys, weights, et cetera, et cetera. Where, um, as a pro it's like, yeah, we have the workout, but then um, to a certain extent, like doing your double runs and all that sort of stuff and doing your, at one point doing our core was on our own. Now we, we do it as a team, but, um, there's a lot of stuff that you kind of left to your own devices to kind of make sure that you're holding yourself accountable. Um, other than that though, I think like just your sponsor and everything, like they do a really good job, job of supporting you and being there for you. Um, I know that like, if there was any sort of problem that I ever had with uh, my sponsor, like as soon as I bring it up, they're just like, how do we fix this as soon as possible? So it was nice to know that, um, you know, when you go pro, like there's a whole team that's dedicated to making sure that you feel good. And like, you have all the essentials that you need and, um, it's their job to make sure of that. So if you bring up a problem, it's going to get fixed because, you know, that's what their job is to fix the, fix whatever you're dealing with. So that would be my summary of being a pro. Um, I feel like it's almost like going to college again where you're on the circuit and there's like, you know, the Ingebrigtsen's, the Kajelchas, the Chepta guys, like it's, it's interesting. You know, you're not at that level, but you gotta try not to get scared and try to work out. Sorry. Someone's calling me, but yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Um, I appreciate the answer as CPT and Ben, I hate to take this question away from you, but we're getting some kind of last minute questions coming in from, um, the audience that um, I'd love to jump over to. Um, one of them here is NCPT. We'll go to you first, and then and then over to Ben. Save Justin some uh, some speaking here for a minute. Um, the biggest moment of adversity or self self doubt that you've experienced, um, and any tips for uh, athletes to develop a strong mentality uh, slash mindset when it comes to competing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think. Ben and I can both speak on this because we both have our fair share of injuries. Uh, I would say that getting injured in college is not necessarily the same as being injured as a pro. Uh, being injured as a pro, uh, and, I mean, it's been a big part of my pro career so far, unfortunately, but uh, there's definitely a burden. Uh, you don't really have a social circle as you used to have. Uh, you don't have school to take your mind off of the running. And, uh, you know, you really got to take care of um your mental health i think and you really got to make sure that you you have a good circle around you and people that are here to help you out and encourage you and lift you up because uh you know when the one thing you're supposed to do in this world is to run and you can't do it like it's it can be really daunting uh whereas in college you know i've i've been injured one season Uh, i ran one race indoors uh, and you sports only has an indoor season I ran one race at the beginning of the season and then tore, uh, twi- uh, twisted my Achilles, couldn't run for the rest of the season. And uh, 
I mean, it was heartbreaking and, you know, uh, I was able to just take a step back and really have another role in the, within the team. Uh, I was more of a cheerleader on the team now. And, you know, I would just show up at practice to talk with the guys and, you know, make sure everyone was doing all right. And, um, I flew to our national championship to make, you know, just to be part of the team spirit and make sure everything uh, went well with, um, the team goals. Uh, that were set at the beginning of the season. So, um, you know, there's that. And then you have academics to deal with as well. So I think as a, as a student athlete, it, it can be a bit easier to go through an injury because um, you do have more stuff to take your mind off of the injury. Um, but one thing that I will say is, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I should say this, but like right now I'm 30 and uh, my training is going better than ever. And this is after I've been being stopped or like really on and off for more than three years. And, you know, like being 30 and having some of my best training ever and thinking back to when I was 19, 20 or 21 and getting an injury was the end of the world and thinking like, am I done? Like, you're absolutely not done. If you want to put the effort into rehab, if you want to put the effort into bettering yourself. And if you want to readjust your, um, uh, your expectations and your goals, which I think is very important, you can get better. And, you know, when you get injured really badly, that means your goals are not the Olympics anymore. It's to be able to run 10 minutes uh, without pain. And you got to be able to really do that, to be able to take a step back, to be able to go further after. So that would be my, uh, I guess my, uh, the one trick I would have to, to say, really readjust your goal. And, you know, as, as silly, like as a, uh, cliche as it sounds uh you're gonna get stronger like don't don't give up uh if you really put the effort into it you will get stronger and uh this is a 30 year old talking and you know 90 percent of pro athletes retire before the age of 30 because they get injured and because they give up that's what it is like i don't have many friends my age around me anymore that are competing they're all retired and that's the harsh reality of the sport but here am i running better than ever and you know, if I can do it at the age of 30, you guys can do it at the age of 17, 18, 19, or beyond that. That's all I have to say. Yeah. CPT. Thanks, Charles. Sorry, Brad. Go for it, Ben. I was no, no, no. Say, I was uh, just going to say. <laughs> all right, cool. CPT, I love what you said about readjusting because where I was going with this is for me, a strong mentality comes from confidence and a confidence comes from momentum. And I used to think that if I just overloaded my system, did as much as I could all the time, I would get better. And the harsh reality was I got hurt or I got too tired of my training, kind of lost quality. So what I found is, you know, I really focus on more of like a, a momentum approach where I want to just set goals. I always have my dreams, the big goals I want to accomplish. I know Justin's really big on that too, but uh, you know, it's really about setting those like, um, incremental goals that you really want to just like focus on and being positive and like recognizing um, your progress on the way to those. And I think that's what kind of builds that momentum and confidence that can lead to uh, those big results. And, you know, once you've gone from here to here, to here, to here, it doesn't seem like much at a time, but then all of a sudden you're up here without even realizing it. And, you know, that's when you might have the best race yeah. of your life. That's what I'll say on that. Uh, I think uh, modifying your goals and understanding where you're at and setting goals accordingly is a really helpful strategy. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ben. Thanks, CPT, for, for sharing that as well. Um, we've got just a couple minutes left here. So um, I would love to do the fastest um, rapid fire questions ever for each question, just because this is the order on my yeah. screen. We're going to go CPT, Ben, <laughs> Justin. Um, socks or no socks when you race? No socks. 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 You're weird, uh, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> no socks and spikes. I'm sorry. No socks and spikes. <laughs> your your go to pre race meal. Uh, whatever there is. Yeah, I don't. Easy guy. <laughs> Whatever's there. <laughs> Starbucks ham and Swiss sandwich. <laughs> That's a good sandwich. It is good. I'm it's a... yeah. I have an I'm explanation. Not... I won't go into it, but okay. Uh, I'll do chicken parm, assuming that it's dinner. <laughs> oh you know what I'll all right go with what I, i'll go with the uh the whole food burrito oh, nice. great check that out <laughs> okay 
Um, and uh, last last question here is going to be a two parter for each of you. Same order. Um, are you going splits or tights? And pair that with uh, the quickest piece of <laughs> advice that you could leave um, a high school athlete with if they're thinking about going to college. Uh, splits for splits for anything over a K. I have tights for anything under a K. Um, and uh, my best piece of advice would be to uh, um, look out for that team environment. Um, I think uh, the you know athletics and academics are very important, but feeling like you belong in, in a team is also uh, very important. I would say. Uh, I'm going. Uh, I've got a uh, double answer too, but I'm going splits over 10 degrees Celsius, half tights under 10 degrees Celsius, regardless of distance. <laughs> Um, my advice for a uh, high schooler looking to run in college is to put yourself out there. Um, it's amazing to get recruited. Um, and if a coach reaches out to you, awesome. Congratulations. Uh, but don't run into the same thing I ran into, like, just, you know, put yourself out there. Um, try to get in contact relate with coaches, um, build that relationship. And, uh, you know, I think ultimately it opens up more doors for you, uh, to see what's out there. Awesome. Uh, so for me, I'm going to do another surprise. I'll do, I only work out in splits. Ben knows this. I only work, oh, no, 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 half tights. Sorry. I only work out in half tights and I race in split shorts all the time. Like that, um, like that. Yeah. I feel fast. I don't know. It's weird. But, <laughs> um, and then the advice I'd give is obviously I mentioned earlier the academic piece and how important that is. But then also like just be patient. You know, everybody's journey, everybody's process is different. Um, you know, just because someone might look like they're ahead of you doesn't mean they are. And just know that everybody gradually improves at their own pace. So just be patient with your process, with your training and, uh, listen to coach. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Guys, thanks so much for the time tonight or this, this evening, wherever, wherever you happen to be, uh, in the continent. I know we're coming from different time zones. Uh, we at Streamline Athletes really appreciate the time that you spent with us this evening. Uh, sharing some of your stories, sharing some of your insights from high school to college. Um, I do want to mention that I forgot to say this off the top. Uh, we have a prize giveaway that was happening today. Um, we have selected a winner. So if you're listening to the call still, go check your email inbox. We're going to send something out this evening, I think. Um, and we'll have a winner selected. Um, CPT and Justin and Ben are all over our social media channels to so make sure that you go Give us a follow at Streamline Athletes and check out these guys on social so we can follow their careers, especially in this big Olympic year. CPT, Justin, Ben, we're watching. We're cheering for you guys. Uh, go Canada and uh, have a fantastic Thank season. Um, thanks for joining thanks, us Brad. tonight. Thank you. Thank thanks you. for having us. Thanks, everybody. Okay, guys, take care.